Do these skulls look the same? How about these? The closer species are related, the trickier it gets. But differences are always there. Analyzing skull shape can tell us tons about animal structure, function and evolution. Traditional morphometrics use simple linear measurements. But to compare whole shapes, we can use geometric morphometrics. In this episode, I'm going to break down this surprisingly badass method and then I'm going to show you a little bit about how researchers use it to study skulls. Dr. Rex here, welcome to the Scullywag Lab where I break down the bare bones basics of skull science. Today, we're diving into geometric morphometrics. I've used this method a ton in my research, sometimes along with finite element analysis, to investigate function, evolution, and development of the skull. Studying whole shape differences is nothing new. It dates all the way back to the likes of Dürer in the 16th century, and was expanded on massively by Darcy Thompson in the early 20th century. His transformation grids, showing how shapes shift across species, are still iconic today. But to scientifically compare shape, we need a mathematical and repeatable way to isolate it. And that's where things get really interesting. Let's start with what I mean by shape. Imagine that you and two of your friends each draw a simple triangle on separate pieces of paper. Each drawing is a little bit different. One's bigger, another's tilted, and they're all in different spots on the page. But if we want to compare just their shapes, we need to remove their differences in size, position, and rotation. We do this by first converting each triangle into numbers, in the form of coordinates representing each corner. Then we align them mathematically. That's what we call shape in a mathematical sense. It's Cartesian coordinate data that is independent of size, rotation, and translation. We call this process Procrustes superimposition. Why? Because in Greek mythology, Procrustes was a bandit that had a keep outside of Athens. He would visit the local inn and invite unwary travellers to stay with him. There, he had an iron bed. But if they didn't fit the bed, he'd either stretch them out to fit or chop them down to size. Pretty grim, I know, but a fitting and badass name for a method that involves forcing shapes to align before we can compare them. So once we've done the Procrustes superimposition, what we're left with is the pure shape data that's ready for analysis. And we can use this in tons of different ways. Sometimes it might be used for biomechanical data to relate shape to function, or maybe it can be combined with genetic data to relate shape differences to the presence or activation of specific genes. Now let's put this method into action using my data set of nearly 400 wallaby skulls. The genus Petragale has 17 species scattered across Australia, making them a perfect group of animals for studying things like adaptations to climate differences, genetics, morphology, whole range of things. Firstly, I collected 3D scans of the skulls and placed landmark points at key locations. But looking at the raw landmark data, it's a mess. Different skulls scanned at different angles and scales, just horrible. After running a Procrustes superimposition though, everything lines up way better, with the small clusters representing variation at each landmark. Very nice. And the superimposition also calculates a nice measure of skull size based on the coordinates, called centroid size. Now one major influence on skull shape is size. This is a relationship called allometry. So let's take a look at how allometry influences skull shape across this genus of rock wallabies. Running a basic model, we find that size explains around 16% of the total shape variation in the sample. Not bad, but what does that actually mean? Firstly, we can plot the relationship. Smaller species like the Monjon and Nabalek are at one end, and the big boys like the Proserpine rock wallaby and the yellow-footed rock wallaby are at the other end. And then we can predict skull shapes expected at either end of this line and compare the landmarks. Now let's visualize how skull shape changes with size. In this image, the orbs represent the shape of the smallest size and the end of the lines represent the shape of the largest size. So we can see that in general, a larger rock wallaby skull will have a longer face, a smaller brain and smaller eye sockets. But you know what? We can visualize this even better. Bonus. Let's bring in a mesh of a rock wallaby from the sample, and then we can warp it to the predicted shapes of the smallest and largest skulls. And boom! Check out this morphing animation. You can see how the skull proportions shift as the animals get bigger. Glorious! And that's the lightning fast introduction to geometric morphometrics. It's an incredibly useful tool for studying the evolution, function, biomechanics of not just skulls, but also of other bones and shells and other cool things. 
If you want to dive deeper, the full data set and code for my Rock Wallaby research is available on GitHub. Link in the description. Catch you in the next video.